Hello, good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Matthew McClendon. I'm the J. Sanford Miller Family Director of the Fraylin Museum of Art, and I am so pleased that you can join us for the first in a series of panel discussions with UVA alumni who are working in museum and the wider museums and the wider arts. Just a reminder, uh, if you do have questions, you can type those using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We may get to some of them in the course of the conversation and we'll definitely have time for a few at the end of the evening. I must start off tonight by thanking Professor Emeritus Paul Borolsky, who first approached me with a list that he had compiled of alumni working in the arts and this idea shortly after my arrival at UVA. What started out as an idea for a multi-day symposium, bringing our alumni together to talk about critical issues facing the arts kept being delayed for various reasons. And so with our current situation and our almost total reliance on web-based interaction and programming, Paul and several of our, several members of our volunteer board suggested we revisit this idea virtually. And I am so glad that they did. By convening our alumni in these virtual webinars, we are actually able to reach a wider and more varied audience. At the core of Professor Borowski's brilliant idea is demonstrating to our current students the varied career paths open to them in the arts and the truly profound alumni network they will join and enjoy the support of. So thank you, Paul, and our volunteer board for supporting this program. And I can tell you, um, in looking through tonight's uh, list of attendees, we have a number of both undergraduate and graduate students uh, with us this evening. So I'm really pleased uh, with that. With that, I am so honored to be joined for, the, for our first discussion by two alumni who are now museum directors. Dr. Melanie Adams is the director, excuse me, of the Smithsonian's Anacostia Community Museum with more than 25 years of community engagement experience in museums and higher education, she is dedicated to bringing stakeholders together to address relevant community issues. Previously, she served as deputy director for learning initiatives at the Minnesota Historical Society. Before that, she was managing director of the Missouri Historical Society for 11 years. Adams holds a doctorate from the University of Missouri St. Louis in educational leadership and policy studies a master's degree in education from the University of Vermont, and most importantly for us, a bachelor's degree in English and African American studies from the University of Virginia. The Anacostia Community Museum has one of the best mission statements I have ever read. It is, quote, together with local communities, the Anacostia Community Museum illuminates and amplifies our collective power. Founded in 1967 by the Smithsonian as an outreach effort to the local African American community, throughout its storied history of over 50 years, the museum has remained relevant, developing documentation projects, ex exhibitions, and programs which speak to the concerns, issues, and triumphs of communities, and which tell the extraordinary stories of everyday people. Welcome, Melanie. In 1992, Dr. William Underwood Island was appointed the director of the Georgia Museum of Art at the University of Georgia. He holds a bachelor's degree from Birmingham Southern College, and again, importantly for us, the master's and doctoral degrees from the University of Virginia. Island has edited and contributed to more than 60 publications and has served on the boards of the American Alliance of Museums, the Southeastern Museums Conference, and the Georgia Association of Museums and Galleries, as well as being a trustee of the Association of Art Museum Directors, as well as many, many other organizations. The Georgia Museum of Art on the campus of the University of Georgia in Athens is both an academic museum and since 1982, the official art museum of the state of Georgia. The permanent collection consists of American paintings, primarily from the 19th and 20th century, American, European, and Asian works on paper, the Samuel H. Crest study collection of Italian Renaissance paintings, and, a growing, collect and growing collections of Southern decorative arts and Asian art. Its schedule is a reflection of the academic study of the history of art and a broader array of popular exhibitions that appeal to all audiences. So welcome, Melanie and Bill. I am so happy that you agreed to join me this evening to, to kick off this series. Welcome virtually back to Charlottesville. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. So I have to say, as a historian, um, 
every time we are not living in unprecedented times. And every time someone says that we are living in unprecedented times, and a historian somewhere shudders. Uh, but we are certainly living in the strangest times many of us have experienced in our lifetimes. And that um, I think we'll begin with um, nine months ago, uh, we began a global pandemic. And from March, museums across the country began closing because of COVID-19. Some have reopened or are in the process of reopening. Some are still closed, many are still closed. And so I wanna begin with looking back over the last seven months, what do you think the single biggest impact of COVID has been for museums in general and for yours in particular? And also I gave just the briefest thumbnail sketches of your museum. So if you wanna fill in a bit on that and um, we'll start with you, Melanie. Sure, sure. Well, again, thank you for inviting me. Um, and I think that is a really important question in terms of how COVID-19 has impacted museums. And I think the most important um, way right now is in its staffing. Um, so many museums had to furlough or let go um, of a lot of great um, staff people. And most importantly, it's their front facing staff people. So as museums look to engage communities they had to let go the people whose job that was. Um, so I think it is going to take some time for museums to be able to build that back up once they're able to reopen. Um, I think one of the um, silver linings for lack of a better word is it's really forced us to think of other ways to engage with our community and forced us to think outside of our four walls. Um, and so a lot of museums are doing um, a lot of great creative work around that. Um, but again, that takes staffing um, and understanding that as museums either have to close, furlough, um, whatever they need to do to meet their bottom line, the staff that's impacted is really important because I think that goes deeper into the whole arts community um, any type of arts, arts um, organization right now is really being impacted. And what I'm hoping is it doesn't discourage young museum professionals, because uh, I've heard a lot who are now like, well, I don't know if I'm going to stay in the field because I don't know if I'm going to be able to get another job in the field. Right. And what if this happens again? I'm obviously always the first one let go if I'm in certain um, departments within the museum. Right. And I think, you know, in the conversations that we're having that are playing out across all platforms, um, the staff that you were talking about who are so often the first to be furloughed um, or let go um, are predominantly our lower paid staff mm -hmm. and frequently our um, staff of color. Um, right. We're bringing much needed diversity into the conversation in museums. So all of that um, is adding to, I think, um, all, all of the points we'll touch on um, tonight. Bill, what do you agree? Do you think um, what, what for you has been the biggest first impact of COVID-19? I agree with you and um, I'll be talking about equity and it's precisely what you and Melanie were just uh, suggesting when we talk about um, racial justice um, later on. But probably for me, the biggest impact of the COVID uh, pandemic has been the swerve, I call it the swerve rather than the pivot. We have all taken to virtual programming. Uh, in our case, that change was sudden and thorough in, and is now, after nine months, a fixture of our activities at the Georgia Museum of Art. As I said earlier, I'm not a technocrat, but I have become convinced that in spite of the lack of nuance or personality, Zoom, what we're doing right now, for example, and webinars are our new reality. But then again, so are virtual events at the museum. Our entire programming at the Georgia Museum of Art, uh, at least until we're clear of this pandemic, will be virtual. And after the virus abates, we shall have one foot in the virtual world and the other in the analog world. And the reasons why, for our own site gallery tours, because of space considerations normally, they're restricted to about 40 people or fewer because of the size of the galleries. For our virtual tours since March, we have had as many as 250 people that we've been able to reach. That holds true for all of our programming and without any exception, we have had more virtual audiences than we have had real ones in the past. That's the most obvious change brought by COVID to my museum 
and to museums in general, I believe, but more insidious has been the fear, the uncertainty, the almost daily need to raise the morale of one of my employees. And of course, the financial exigency in which we find ourselves now and for the foreseeable future. For example, my museum lost all general operating support mm -hmm. and I've had to raise it for us to have stamps, phones, insurance, et cetera. We're good for this year, but with the positions we've lost, I fear for the future. I think, you know, already you've brought up so many outstanding points that I think perhaps the wider public has some knowledge of, um, but it's really important to remember um, you know, museums, particular art museums, collecting museums are certainly about the objects in our care, but it's always people first. And that um, for me as a relatively new director um, has, you know, I'm right along with what both of you have said. Um, this has really distilled how much we have to lean into people first in all that we do, both within the museum, um, but also the, the communities that we, that we serve. Um, you know, you talk about uh, how, and we'll, we'll, I'm sure this will be a, a light motif as we go through the evening, how as we all move virtually, it is opening up possibilities. And, uh, you know, we had over 100 people sign up for this webinar tonight. We wouldn't have had that if we were just doing it in Charlottesville. We have people um, all over um, joining us. So that is, that is very exciting. Um, and that I think absolutely is, is here to stay. But I'm wondering, Bill, because you have reopened, um, what has been the experience of reopening and welcoming people back into the galleries? Um, if you could talk, I, I don't think, you know, Bill and I are in several groups together that are meeting regularly throughout, that have been meeting regularly. And we have had, you know, incredibly intense conversations about health and safety, public health. Um, I now know what a MERV 13 air filter is <laughs> about you know, all of these things that I, uh, as an art historian, um, did not think would be on my plate. So I'm wondering, you know, Bill, if you could go a little into just the logistics of what it means to close down a museum, but then reopen a museum in the time of a pandemic. Well, that's interesting that you mentioned that because not only part of our protocol was when we closed down, when we began to think about reopening in fear of another surge and having to close down, we had a protocol for closing now. Um, we coordinated our opening with the University of, of uh, Georgia and the state of Georgia. Both were necessary because as you mentioned, we're the State Museum of uh, Fine Arts. Um, the staff worked with me and we prepared our own or protocols for opening. Um, we followed the guidelines of OSHA and um, of the CDC, which is of course, as you know, in Atlanta, as well as the university guidelines. But we also had a difficulty right at the beginning with the mask ordinance of Athens, Georgia, because it did not match the states, nor did it match the universities at that time. Um, so in spite of Georgia's discretionary law, no one we decided could get in the museum without a mask. Um, and when we opened, that was contrary to the university's protocol as well. But now the University of Georgia, of course, is, is requiring masks as well. But since I knew that masks had become politicized, as we all know how politicized they become, we included in the earliest training we did for our frontline staff, confrontation training, um, especially uh, for the frontline employees, in fact. The biggest challenges when we reopened was, again, fear. As I said earlier, fear from the staff about rumors of furloughs, salary cuts, layoffs, and fear for the safety of their families and their children that were being left at home. Um, I presented our protocols to the provost office especially for staggering the staff's working hours so that we could take care of some of that fear and some of that uncertainty. Um, I also had to beg that the 10% cut, which took all of our general operating support, plus two positions 
um, that it be reduced to the 8% that was being given to teaching units. I got on my highest horse, in fact, and argued that we are an academic unit. And if not that, we should be recognized as having academic standing. In short, I argued that the museum is neither auxiliary nor ancillary, but it is essential to object-based inquiry and teaching. Um, and then, as I want to do, throwing products to the wind, I reminded <laughs> the associate provost that we at the museum believe in the university's mission to inquire into the nature of things. And that meant studying and presenting what is essential to service teaching and scholarship. Finally, for once the argument worked, but for only this one time probably, but the salaries of the two staff members who were going to be laid off, I was able to get them restored to us. Next fiscal year, however, I anticipate having the same damn struggle. Thank you, Bill. That, um, you know, speaks to the academic museum, but that really does summarize what I think all museums, all cultural institutions are going through in this time. Uh, and the very real uh, economic circumstances that we're all facing, not just now, and you ended on such a good point, this isn't for the fiscal year that we're in. This will have ramifications for all of us moving forward into fiscal year. So um, audience members tonight, this will be the first moment when I remind you how important it is to support your local community arts organizations, be it museums, theaters, ballets, whatnot. Um, they don't, we don't need your support just now. We will need your support going forward because this is a, um, a generational change um, that we are all facing right now. And I also wanna say for our audience, if this is the first time you are hearing the great Bill Island speak, you now know why he has the reputation among art museum directors and certainly academic museum directors as our greatest orator. <laughs> um, so I'm thrilled that you could join us tonight, Bill. <laughs> uh, Melody, it's something that we, we've already touched on um, that is one of the real challenges in this time is keeping those connections and those relationships with our community and our audiences. And you are, of course, the Anacostia Community Museum. Um, so I would love to hear a little bit more about what community means in, in your title and in, in, in the museum's title, um, but also how you are engaging, continuing to not only sustain those relationships, but continuing to build those relationships in this time. Sure, and I did just want to quickly touch on finances because I think so many people assume because we're a Smithsonian, we are 100% federally funded and we had a conversation about our um, mutual friend Bob who's in advancement and that is not true. Um, we are not 100% federally funded. So when the doors closed, we lost revenue related to um, gift shops, restaurants, um, paid events. So it did impact everyone regardless um, or not whether or not you were a public or a private institution. In terms of community, this in a weird way, it's providing us, it's forcing us <laughs> to think of other ways in which we can serve them. And I feel like when everyone closed in March, Zoom was very novel, but I think we all have Zoom fatigue because we're on it all day. And so for a lot of people, the last thing they may want to do is be on it all weekend for a program. And so what we're really looking at specifically in Anacostia is how can we do programs that are not on Zoom that are really low touch? And I think to Bill's point, he was talking or beginning to talk a little bit about equity. Um, the Anacostia Community Museum is located in Ward 8 in Southeast DC, which would be a lower income area. I don't think our Zoom programs are actually reaching the people within walking distance of our community. Um, they're reaching people all over the world who are logging in, but it's not the people that could walk to us. So one of the things we're really going to focus on moving forward is how do we serve the people who are living within walking distance of the museum? We have um, public housing right near the museum. There's a homeless shelter. So how are we serving those people is really going to be the focus and figuring out a way to do that um, safely. 
Uh, do you, are you finding in your community, so Bill touched on something that I think we're all finding with our audiences, a uh, fear. Um, fear of coming together again, fear of being in any kind of programming. So when you're talking, you know, low touch, how do we how do we get past that fear that we all rightly have? Right. And when I mean low touch, I mean we'll create something, you drive up to the museum, pick it right. up and go home. <laughs> right. Right. Um, but one of the things that we're also really looking at is how do we activate our outdoor spaces? Because I think as both you and Bill said, people may not be willing to come into our doors, but they may be willing to stand on our patio and look at a projection on the building. Right. So really looking at our space and places where people will feel safe and that is more of the outdoor areas. So that's another thing we're really going to explore is how can we share content actually on our building. Absolutely, and I think that's exactly what we're finding at the, the Fralin as well. So we are closed um, now into the spring semester because of oh. long, long planned building work. We're having a new roof, new HVAC system. Um, what, and I've, I've made this joke so many times, what was the bane of my existence for two years planning for now has come at the absolute perfect time of, <laughs> of having the building closed. Um, but, you know, we're finding that Zoom fatigue as well, particularly, I'll say, in our young professionals audience, right. because they are on all day long. Um, and so we are to, we're looking at um, how to create walking tours of arts mm -hmm. on grounds, walking tours around grounds, what kind of apps you can have. So the more self-guided experience, um, which has always been something that I think we've thought of in museums, but we've always wanted that contact and that guided experience. Right. So it's really forcing a shift in our every way of thinking at every level of the museum, I find. So, you know, that, that kind of sets the stage for, you know, the, the first real revolution that, set, that is sweeping through museums, but certainly we have to talk about what is, I, I think, the more profound revolution that is sweeping through all cultural institutions. Um, and that's, of course, in the wake of George Floyd's death or killing on May 25th, uh, Breonna Taylor, who had um, died on March 13th earlier, um, but I think came to more prominence in the wake of George Floyd and uh, the protests around uh, white supremacy and systemic racism. Uh, then of course we had Ahmaud Arbery, Tony McDade, Don Johnson, Jonathan Price, the names just keep coming um, and are added to the names from the years before. Uh, and I think it's safe to say that America is in a moment of reckoning with institutional and systemic racism and white supremacy uh, on a level not seen really since the civil rights era. And it's, and as we can see in protests around the world, this is becoming a global call to action. Uh, like I said, it's reverberating, of course, through museums and galleries and all cultural institutions and forcing us to have um, a really honest and self-critical conversation. Um, but beyond conversation, which um, I think Bill will talk some about, we've got to move to action. Um, so Melanie, I'm wondering, are you, we're still in this, we're still very much in this moment, but are you already seeing changes in the field or is it too early to say? Um, and I'm wondering what changes um, do you most hope to see in the field coming out of these um, really horrific circumstances? Right, and um, so the Anacostia Community Museum was actually founded out of a time just like this. So we were founded, as you mentioned, in 1967, during and because of the racial unrest that was happening around the country. So when you look at a lot of your community-based museums or your ethnic museums, this is why and how we were created. Um, and so I really think the onus is on a lot of your more encyclopedic or your museums who may have come out of a different type of founding. Um, because I always say that museums of color um, have always been telling these stories. So we always have had diverse narratives. Um, this is nothing new for us. But as you look at more of a mainstream museum, like one of the questions um, my director friends and I always ask each other, it's like, what makes what made George Floyd different? Because, you know, I was in St. Louis during Mike Brown. I was in Minneapolis during Philando Castile and it didn't catch, like it was a few months worth of protests, but there was something about George Floyd and it could have been the pandemic as well that has made really people have called for change. And I think part of what we determined why that it was, was because all of a sudden, and I'm sure Bill will talk about this, all these museums put out statements. Mm -hmm. 
And they weren't putting out statements for Mike Brown, Philando Castile and others, unless they were in that community. But all of a sudden, every museum around the country is putting out statements and they were getting pushed back from their employees or their staff who were like, you put out this statement, that's not my experience working there. Um, so what type of, again, um, what type of action are museums going to take? Because they're gonna be called to task. Um, people are keeping track of these statements right. and what people are saying they're going to do. And there will be some type of reckoning of, you said this, are you really doing it? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and so you bring up such an important point that ethnic museums and community museums have been doing this work for a long time. We need to acknowledge that. It's art museums and other types of museums that are painfully late to the game um, and have not, have been a lot of talk. And that's something I, I've been in the, the field for 20 years now and it's been a lot of talk. Um, so I, before, before we move on from this, because it's I think so critical and I want to learn from this, um, what can we do as art museums to be better allies to you as ethnic and community museums? Um, because we haven't been. Our organizations are even separate. Um, you know, Bill and I are part of the Association of Art Museum Directors, um, which I would love to see and hear your voice in, Melanie, but you're not at a quote unquote art museum. Art museum right. So exactly, <laughs> um, which is the real, I think speaks to a real problem in our field. So, um, you know, you've got two academic art museum directors, but um, other, other people will be um, listening in on this. So if, if there is a way or that you think that we as art museums could be better allies um, to the work that's being done, has been done in ethnic and community museums. I think um, it really is um, a community by community situation. And so I encourage art museums to reach out to the um, community and ethnic museums within their small cities and towns. But more importantly, it's really important to create a sustainable relationship. And so it's not one and done. Right. So it's like, oh, we did, we co-created an exhibit. We've checked that off the box. Now we'll go and do something else. Or you only come to that museum when you're in trouble or you need something right. versus just creating that ongoing communication. And there probably will be a project just, just comes about. Um, it doesn't have to be something that's overly scripted, overly planned, but just keeping those lines of communications open um, with your museum, with the museums in your community, because it's not only art museums, it's science centers, it's all of these different arts and cultural organizations. It would be great to have kind of a united front around certain topics and issues yeah. in the community. Yeah, I think absolutely. And I, I, you know, I so appreciate what you're saying. It has to be, and you have to come to them honestly not out of, not reactionary. Um, you have to come to them and it has to be a sustained relationship. And I think that's, you know, the talk that we're having uh, throughout the field in, um, as we know, we have, we have to um, and have had to diversify the voices working in all types of museums. Um, and, you know, we've had piecemeal uh, plans for that and actions to that, and it hasn't been sustained. And I, I, I think maybe that's, the change I'm seeing and so happy to see um, at this point that there's an understanding, a better understanding now that this is not one and done, as you said. Um, Bill, I, I wanna bring you in because um, you have a long history um, within uh, the museum world of really advocating for what we now are terming DEAI, um, which for our audience hasn't heard that term, you're gonna be hearing that term a lot diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion, DEAI. Um, and as we've been saying, as I've said, my great frustration has always been that there's been a lot of talk. We've been having the same conversation since I was a museum studies student 20 years ago, um, rather than action. So are you seeing this as different now? Um, and how are you um, seeing this as different, Bill? I'm seeing it as different, but not different enough. Um, to be blunt, um, right. and to respond to what Melanie said, um, I am from South Alabama. I went to the University of Virginia for a PhD. So uh, I'm about as white and Southern as you can get. Um, so I decided that one way, one way in which I could do something to learn um, 
let's say what my museum could do, how it could change is I joined the AAAMG, the African-American group, um, and have even presented papers there and have done it on purpose. But what I found is something that Melanie was stressing and, or, and that you also mentioned and that I think that the audience should know. Whereas we as art museums talk about objects African-American museums, I have found, talk about people. And so, although both are important, it's where you place the emphasis. So, Matthew, I remember, and I, uh, I don't believe you had uh, yet gone to the University of Virginia, but I remember several years ago that at a meeting of the Association of Art Museum Directors, the AMD, that um, Janetta Cole was our speaker as well as our president. And upon hearing questions from the audience when she was speaking that diversifying the staff would be difficult to achieve, especially in academic museums because of an onerous dictated salary structure. And she said vehemently and directly, she said, change it, just do it. No more excuses. Your smart people find a way. So I took that to heart and set out to find an endowment for my museum for a curator of the African diaspora. I insisted in addition that the board of advisors, the board of our friends and the decorative arts advisory committee, that they all had to diversify and that in particular, that we had to look in diversifying to the professionals as well as to administrative positions um, or to gallery attendance. We still, with the staff, have not been as successful as I would like, but one instance of how we are proceeding is that I am insisting in spite of and we'll have to negotiate this with the University of Georgia, that we have diverse candidates for openings at the museum, or we don't go forward until our candidates represent our community, both academic and lay. The issues are different now because we are talking louder and routinely bemoaning systemic injustices, but not enough. Just as you intimated, Matthew, and you and I have talked about before, I find process tiresome and prefer action. Yeah, absolutely, Bill. Um, we we definitely we definitely share that, and I also think it's you know we are in a moment when we need to elevate and amplify Black voices, and that is critical. Um, but you have spoken very eloquently. Um, at AMD meetings, and I also believe this, that diversity goes beyond that. Diversity is economic diversity. Diversity is gender identity diversity, sexual sexuality diversity. Um, pardon? Age. Age diversity, absolutely. Um, religious diversity, all of, all of this. Um, and so as we are moving forward in our work at the Fralin, um, we have a great partner with the um, Equal Opportunity and Civil Rights um, Office at UVA and really looking at how um, the university defines diversity, um, you know, ability um, as well, able-bodiedness. So um, that what, you know, has to be a part of the conversation too. And I think that all of those voices or indigenous voices are coming um, to the forefront uh, as well. But you, as you said it so eloquently, Bill, um, and this is something that we have to really retrain ourselves in many instances. Um, we have these objects in our collections because of the people and the cultures who made them. And that needs to be the story that we focus on, the people who made these objects um, and how that figures into the object biography as well. And that's something we have not necessarily done well at the art museum and is the great divide um, between the types of museums. I think, um, gosh, we're already running short on time. I knew that would happen. I wanna you know, move ahead. I've got two 
wonderful directors here with me. So I want to be specific. How are these revolutions in the museum changing the role of director? Melanie, why don't we? I think you have to be okay with ambiguity. Like Amen. I was just on a call about a possible traveling exhibit and it's like, I don't know if I can take that traveling exhibit because I don't know if I'm gonna be open. Um, and so you really have to be able to deal with ambiguity. And also you're taking care of your staff in a very different way. Um, you know, unfortunately we're doing a lot of Zoom calls and things because I can't just pop my head into someone's office. Um, so, and that's not something like we weren't trained as directors to figure out how to manage remotely. So I think we're all learning that on the fly as well. Um, but I also like to think of it as it gives us so much opportunity. Uh, when we look back on this time four or five years ago, we're going to say it was really painful and we hated we went through it, but we're glad we did because we were able to come out better on the other end. So it's only the museums who recognize that this is an opportunity to make substantive change are going to survive at the end of this. Absolutely. If they try to go back to business as usual, they are not going to be relevant to their communities. 100%. Bill? Well, the substantive change exactly that she's talking about and which we are particularly um, interested in right now at the Georgia Museum of Art is equity because exactly what we've been talking about happened. And that was the gallery attendants, the housekeeping staff and the security guards. They were the first to be on the chopping block. Mm -hmm. And of course they are the lowest paid individuals in the museum. And it amazes me that we as a profession give our oversight of our objects, of our audiences, of our staffs to the less well paid people in the museum. And then we expect them to be professional and public relations experts at well, as well. Um, so that's one thing, one specific thing that has been on my mind recently about how should I react as a leader, as the leader of the museum. And so uh, what we've basically done is um, because we changed the hours of the museum, the gallery attendants now are basically working for me doing research. And uh, while they don't have, <clears throat> excuse me, while they don't have uh, hours uh, in the galleries, then they actually are working for me. Um, that's one thing we did. And another thing that we have made sure of over the last several years is that women are, have equitable salaries with the male professional staff. Absolutely. So I want to remind our audience about the Q&A function. We've got some questions coming in, which are great. A few of you have written small novellas, which I will try <laughs> and get through, maybe keep them a little shorter. But I want, to, I want to get to one question that I'm just seeing because it speaks to this, and it's such an important question for us to understand as museum directors, but also for our audience to understand. And the question is, Diversifying staff without addressing white supremacy culture often just causes harm for BIPOC staff, and they often quit um, because they are not truly welcome. So what are you doing at your museums to address white supremacy culture in your museum? So I'm going to say this is really more for, for me and Bill um, <laughs> to answer, <laughs> definitely. But I think this is an outstanding question. And I will just say from the Freyland's point of view, um, we are absolutely cognizant of that. We have very few people of color on staff and even fewer on our advisory board. Um, and so the work we are doing now is to ensure that we are a welcoming space and, and place when um, all, all uh, diverse people come in, whether it's as audiences and visitors, but as we move to diversifying the staff so that we are um, a welcoming and healthy environment. And realizing um, that this is not um, uh, our staff of color, this is not their job to do. They are welcome to join in any of the activities that we have around this, our, our anti-racism uh, reading and discussion groups, our DEAI working group, they are welcome to participate and we welcome their participation, but we are very clear that it's not their work to do and, and they can participate on their terms. So Bill? Well, we do much the same thing, uh, Matthew. Um, we 
one thing we do that that has really changed um, the way we think about these issues is by having discussions among the staff. We're not quite as regulated or um, have as many sort of ways of doing it as, as you're describing it, but we actually get together in staff me meetings and uh, I often will bring out a question or ask a question and we have a response and it, it, it ignites um, a discussion. Um, and so basically we're doing much the same things that you are doing, but we are not just talking about race. We're talking about all those other isms that you discussed as well, because if you're talking about white supremacy, there are other supremacists, um, as we have seen recently in Michigan and elsewhere in the United States, um, that we also have to be aware of. And so we try to discuss it all. You and I were discussing earlier tonight um, the president's uh, new general order um, about what words can be used and what words can't be used. And I kept thinking about that George Orwell really is still alive uh, because he uh, has such a perfect example of something to talk about as well. I don't know. Um, we also have been looking very carefully because of this issue and because we are an art museum at um, how we can, and this is another one of those words that has become almost a cliche, but has a real meaning as far as I'm concerned. And that is decolonizing yes. the collection and decolonizing it in significant ways um, through interpretation, but also in recognizing uh, the objects themselves and what they can possibly mean. And we have those discussions and are continuing to have those discussions about the objects in our collection. Absolutely, and that that um, there's another question on um, how are you fostering these environments? I think um, what's meant is environments that are, are comfortable and open and inclusive for BIPOC uh, people and visitors. Can you give specific examples? And I think, uh, the, the conversations around decolonization, particularly in the art museum, are a big part of that. Um, so before we shut down in the pandemic, um, one, we've had a, a larger initiative at uh, the Freyland and at UVA with the Mellon Foundation, Mellon Indigenous Arts Initiative, uh, that was a, a cross-university uh, partnership. But I think so vital for us, and something I talk about a lot, is visibility and having the visibility of indigenous artists come into the museum and speak in the museum and teach us, talk to us about objects in our collection that are relevant to their communities so that we have an understanding. We, we are learning from the knowledge holders of those communities about the objects and then making that available to the public and recontextualizing, decolonizing the objects in that way, I think is one, um, just one way that we've um, been able to um, hopefully increase uh, that kind of environment at the Freyland. We also, I talk about visibility a lot as a member of the LGBTQ community and what it meant not to have visibility in my own youth in many ways. Um, so we made a commitment at the Freylin uh, last September that as we move forward in our exhibition planning and the work that we show in the museum, um, that at least 50% of that is from underrepresented uh, peoples. And again, we define that very broadly in, in tandem with the university, but it's a way of holding ourselves publicly accountable and always having that at the forefront of our mind instead of um, the second thing we think about, it's the first thing we're thinking about as we're doing exhibition planning, because I, I firmly believe that visibility is important, is a very important part of that, knowing that you are welcome and feeling comfortable. Um, that's, just, that's just two things. And I think, Bill, you've, you've touched on some of that as well. Um, we are close to, close to time. We're right on time, actually. Um, before we get to, I, I've got so many great questions here. We won't get to all of them, but before we get to questions, because I know we have students on the line uh, and watching, and we will, this, this will be recorded and put up on our YouTube channel. I just want um, each of you to just very briefly, how did you come to this field? Um, 
frequently we have very circuitous roots, those of us who end up in museums. How did you come to this field? And what's maybe the one best piece of advice you can give to anyone that thinks they might want to work in a museum? Bill, we'll start with you. Did you say me? Yes, I did. <laughs> um, well, how I became museum director, um, but it was by happenstance. Um, my life partner was a uh, student, a graduate student at the University of Virginia at the same time I was. His field was Italian Renaissance, uh, early Italian Renaissance, as a matter of fact. And I guess uh, since I was not an art history major, I've never had an art history course. My training has been through pillow talk, <laughs> literally pillow talk. Um, because at night he would read to me a 14th century, uh, some writing from the 14th century in medieval Italian, and then I had to figure it out. So we <laughs> did that. Um, and that's how really I learned um, uh, what art history I do know. The best uh, bit of advice that I could give to, to museum aspirants, especially those who want to become a director, is to study the liberal arts, because that's what I really, that's my PhD is in something called Idean Geschichte or Kultur Geschichte um, through the history department. And that meant that we studied culture, uh, not specifically the history of art. Uh, so I would advise students, as I do my students, is to study the liberal arts, to learn foreign languages, because foreign languages are inroads into culture, and get yourself an internship. Um, for the future, learn how to negotiate your salary, and know your own worth, and beware of true believers. I'm sure you're all aware of the brouhaha that's going on at Washington and Lee right now over the course taught by Matthew, by Matt Gilder, overthrow the state, which is devoted to a revolutionary theory. His conclusion after undergoing the terrorism and misunderstandings of the press and even his own colleagues is chilling because he said, as he said, this has gone on too long, sharing his pessimism for the future of rational, discourse and economic, excuse me, academic freedom, and even for the future of higher education. His words, I hope, are not prescient of those of you who want to work in academic museums, but they're well worth remembering. Ideology is the antithesis, antithesis of education. Finally, to you students, I would develop and employ the leadership skills of patience and balance. Um, and the final thing I'd say and add would be that as far as possible, during a time when our students are being defined by a plague, the museum and its leader must combat the anxiety and stress, the intense loneliness that I see in my own students of our primary stakeholders. And those primary stakeholders for an academic museum are the students. Absolutely. Thank you, Bill. Melanie? Sure. Um, I think, so again, um, my background is not museums. It's higher education student affairs. And I think um, some of my best advice um, for students is, you know, I got that love for community um, through my work at UVA. Um, I was a RA, I was in university union, you know, they joked that I majored in student activities. And so it really was more of this, how do I create community? That's what I really enjoyed doing. And that's what eventually brought me to the museum field was that ability to be able to build community around history, which was something else that I loved. So I would encourage students to try out as many things as you want. Um, that's one of the great things about college, being able to try different things. Um, but even as you enter your profession, you may not get into the job or the field you want. And I know this is somewhat controversial to say, but I did a lot of volunteering. Like I was in, when I say volunteering, I mean, I was involved in community organizations. 
So I joined like the young professionals of the urban league. You join all these things and gather all these skills and do a lot of networking. Um, because especially within the museum field, it's a very small field. Everyone knows each other. Um, and so being able to kind of make those connections are really important. Yeah, and I, I think that's brilliant advice. And I just want to tease out for our audience because they might not be aware why you said volunteering might be somewhat controversial. <laughs> right, right, right. That's why I tried, yeah. So I meant volunteering yeah. with organizations, like being involved in an right. organization, because I understand even in undergrad, like I didn't have the financial ability to work for free. Right. I could and not intern anywhere for free. And that's been, you know, one of the, the ways that the museum, particularly the art museum, mm -hmm. has been most inequitable is for so long, we relied on uh, free labor, labor yeah. and that free labor came from white affluent young people. Mm -hmm. And when you are relying on that free labor, um, those who cannot afford free labor are kept out of the door. Um, so that's why there is a, a rightful push to paid internships, um, sustainable paid internships, um, not one and done, as you said earlier. Um, so I did just want to clarify that because there is such a, and there still is one of the things I love about UVA, such a push for uh, volunteerism and um, giving back to your community. And so finding a way that you can do that, to your point, you're not only helping your community, you really are um, engaging your own skills and learning, learning um, those vital skills that will be important. And yes, it is a small world in the museum. <laughs> Matthew, nope. there's another side to that as well. Sure. Uh, when you're talking about um, the privilege to get the internships um, at the museum years ago, I had a student from Waycross, Georgia. She'd never been to Athens. She'd never even been to Atlanta and she had certainly not been into a museum. Right. So after four years, I asked her what she wanted to do. And she said that she wanted to she was, she was majoring in art education, that she wanted to teach in the inner city uh, in California or in New York. And I said, well, let's get you an intern. And there's an intern at Howard University. Um, and it's in association with the National Gallery. And she did not get it because her was a B or a C average. So I called up the National Gallery because I was a friend of the directors and I said, can I just ask you a question? Who got, who got those, that fellowship? Uh, who got that internship? And he said, well, we had four. One went to a student at Yale, one went to a student at Princeton, <laughs> one went to a student at um, Harvard, uh, and one went to a student at Howard University. And I said, well, that proves that that, we, there is no equitable playing field there um, because the person who may have needed it the most, as far as I was concerned, because she was my student, didn't get it. And by the way, she is today teaching in Compton, California. Um, and so she has fulfilled what she wanted to do, but it was without the help from that internship or that fellowship. So. Uh, and I think that's a much larger conversation that's happening right now as well. The museum must change, will change. And that means who works in the museum and their backgrounds must change. It doesn't matter what museum you're in. Um, we have got to look outside of our normal recruiting grounds and we will only be stronger uh, because of that. Um, I, we have some great questions, too many to get to because it's been such a great conversation. <laughs> But we have one really specific um, from Melanie from actually our COO at the museum. Um, I was involved peripherally um, in the 1968 project that was coordinated by the Minnesota Historical Society. I don't know if you were involved in that great project, but I wonder if you had thoughts on the future of traveling exhibitions and or what might the transmission of electronic content be like, be like moving forward. Right, so I came to um, Missouri, uh, Minnesota after 68, but we actually did host it in Missouri. So I am well aware of the exhibit and it is amazing. I think the traveling exhibit market is on its way out. And here's why I say that. Museums are now preferring to do contents that's better connected to their community. 
Right. Now, so it's really hard. 68 was such a pivotal year and you could probably connect something to your community from that. But more museums are building their own exhibits that directly relate to the people and events of their city, town or region. So I think traveling exhibits are just really expensive to make and they can't always have those same type of connections. So I really see us seeing less of those large scale um, traveling exhibits that we once saw. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I, I know from many conversations, I think Bill would agree with that too. Um, in the art museum, traveling exhibitions are just so incredibly complex and expensive. Um, and I love your emphasis. We really are understanding we need to be speaking to our communities and that's not necessarily best done through a big traveling exhibition. Do you agree, Bill? I do. Yeah. I do. In fact, um, I think it was at a meeting the other day, I think you were there when I said that uh, I would go so far as to say, let the Southeast become a closed shop so that we can negotiate transportation, so that we can negotiate these outrageous, outrageous fees for couriers. Um, mm -hmm. We don't need couriers anymore. We've got Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, I, I have another question here from one of our great uh, members and volunteer board members, Jane. Uh, Jane, it's I'm not going to get through the whole, I'm going to get to the crux of the question. Um, and this was to Bill, but I, I think it definitely opened it up to, to Melanie as well. Have you had any success uh, receiving funding from uh, your virtual viewers? Uh, do you solicit them? Are we looking at, mon I think the, the question really is, is there a way to monetize what we're doing now in the virtual platform? And I, I have some very clear ideas on that, but I'd, I'd love to hear both of yours. I think we haven't done as good a job of that as we should. I know other Smithsonian museums are doing virtual galas and things. Um, so I think there is an opportunity there. But one of the things I'm finding is funders want to figure out a way, how can we better serve the community that's not virtual. So we're, you know, so they're asking us, what can you get into kids' hands, whether it's an art kit, whether it's pencils, whether it's books, like they want to figure out the physical, knowing that it's such a wide divide, um, it's such a wide digital divide that virtual doesn't reach all of the kids that you would like to. Absolutely. Melanie, you're absolutely right. And what we've done is, in the, uh, even when we were closed, we used our loading dock where we would actually put supplies, we would put books, anything that we could to help the community uh, to continue to, to be active and, uh, and be active in something that was important to us. And that was uh, arts education. And um, now our loading dock has become a little bit too busy <laughs> with people using it. But um, yes, uh, I agree with everything that you said. We have not really gone into fundraising through galas and that, virtual galas and that sort of thing. Um, but um, we had such a problem at the beginning that I had to solve and that was we had to find general operating support. And so we could go to a, we, we didn't go to a black tie evening gown sort of um, reception even over uh, Zoom. Uh, I had to really negotiate um, with our funders as well as the university to get our general operating support. One way that we did it, uh, somebody in the, in the um, Q&A has asked about deaccessioning. I was we, just gonna we, get there, Bill, but I'm gonna tell you we're at time and this is your, this is, uh, you, I, you could speak forever about this. So <laughs> I'm gonna say, I'm, give, us, give, us the, give us the short rundown on deaccessioning, Bill. No, we're not doing it, period, right. that's it. It's, Excellent. It's unethical. No, this is, this is another question that I'm sure will come up um, in these in these panel discussions. Um, the ongoing controversy around deaccessioning works from your collection, um, and what that money has gone to in the past, and what um, we're now seeing it go to um, in these times. And a, a, a phrase that a colleague used um, 
uh, in a meeting yesterday that I, I've held on to situational ethics. But um, as I said, we are um, at, uh, at our time, and I know everyone has a Zoom time limit of one hour, and then you start <laughs> to kind of lose it a bit. So I just want to wrap up by saying thank you so much to Melanie and Bill for being so generous with your time tonight and your thoughts. I have learned so much from both of you, and I know our audience has as well. Um, before we sign off, I just want to tell you about two more programs specifically featuring alumni. Um, on the evening of the 5th of November, which is a Thursday, James Stewart, the director of the Princeton Art Museum and an alumnus of UVA and member of our advisory board at the Fralin, will be our Blizzard lecturer. And James's talk is what I wholeheartedly endorse, how academic art museums can save the world. Um, so I am very much looking um, forward to James uh, and sharing his, his great insights um, as at one of the leading academic art museums uh, in the country. And then on November 10th, we will have the second in this series of alumni in the arts. We'll be talking with some of our graduates uh, who now work in museum education and visitor services. So the, the front lines of museum work. And as uh, Melanie brought up at the beginning of our talk, uh, the ones that have uh, borne much of the brunt of furloughs and layoffs um, as we go through these times. That program's just been confirmed as of yesterday. So save the date, November 10th. It'll be at the same time, 6.30. And look for more information in the coming days on our website and in our e-blast. As always, thank you for supporting the Fralin. Please follow us on social media and keep checking back at the Fralin from home portion of our website to see the new programming that we're adding constantly. And again, I think you've I've heard all the reasons why tonight it is so critical for you to support your local arts organizations. And of course, I'm gonna say your local museums first, but that's also your theaters, um, your dance companies, your opera companies, whatever you are blessed to have in your community. Uh, and as, as Melanie and Bill so clearly stated, it's not just now that they're going to need, we're going to need your support. We're going to need it long into the future. And I think, um, one of the silver linings of all of this and our confinement is showing us just how much we need the arts. So please continue to support your local community arts organizations. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you again, Bill and Melanie. This was Thank an you. absolute treat for me. Um, and we will see you all again soon. Have a great evening. Wear your masks, wash your hands, uh, and we will, we will get through this. All right. Thank you. Thank you.